Good evening, sir. Yo, yo, this is episode 69 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, Brett and CH. Today's topics, looks like the uh, the B-cashers have decided they want to have a development fund. They want to change the monetary policy like many who control the printing press ultimately end up doing. Bitcoin gold was 51% attacked again uh, in the last week. Somebody made away with... Well, almost 70 grand. Pretty good. Not too bad for a few hours work. And then last but not least, uh, I think this is somewhat exciting news. Uh, Jack Dorsey's uh, Square Crypto has finally put forth what they are really going to be working on over the next uh, few months and few years, a lightning development kit for uh, existing wallets to implement and other people to build on top of. So that's exciting news. But what do you think, man? The weekend's over. Monday happened. What's going on today? Uh, coronavirus is getting worse. That's all I have to say. And no one's taking it that seriously yet. I wonder how long till the World Health Organization, the WHO, uh, calls it a pandemic. I mean, as I said it last night, I know it's a little top <clears throat> off topic of what's going on, what we're about to talk about. But I think it's important I mention it really quickly. China is building, at least on top of my head, in Wuhan. They decided to build two 1,000 plus beds each, each hospital. Um, just just build them because they were running out of beds. Now, originally, like before the weekend, there was like twenty, like two thousand cases, maybe twenty five hundred, and that was what they were telling us. That doesn't make any sense. It's like, why would you need to build another over two thousand beds right away? I think they're fudging on the numbers, and now they're saying forty four hundred. Like it's it's gonna get it's probably much higher. If it's ten x that, that means it's forty four thousand. It could be more, and. It's obviously escaped the border. So if you're listening to us, be smart, be safe, you know, try to figure out what's going on. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sketchy. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely sketchy. It really goes with the whole ethos of don't trust, verify. So, uh, you know, if you do have to have any international travel the next couple of weeks, please be as safe as humanly possible. Um, it's just... Uh, you know, with these kinds of things that you, you never know, right? On one hand, you don't want to be the super paranoid tinfoil hat Bitcoiner like every, <laughs> like the rest of the people I feel like we talk to or how, how we think sometimes. But on the other hand, you know, you you can't forgive yourself if you decide to you, – you, you had business travel to China this past week or, you know, maybe to, to another country abroad and you just didn't think twice about it or whatever. I don't know. I think it, at this point it – it is worth it to be uh, a little on the cautious side. Oh, one hundred percent. I had someone recently just message me like they had plans to get a, go to New York and they're this weekend and they're on the fence. And I'm like, dude, I'm like your call. I don't blame you if you don't go at this point because one, as far as we've been told, they've said basically at this point people can be asymptomatic, so they're not showing symptoms and can transmit the virus, and the incubation period is fourteen days. So that's that's a long period, and I think. As we get into February, especially mid-February, late February, we're going to get a greater scope of what's going on. Uh, this isn't going to go away. It's not going away now. I don't think people realize that. Like This is going to be around for months, if not lo- longer. This isn't going to just, oh, the end of February is going to be gone. No, this is going to probably go through the summer, if not into the winter. Um, if you look at the Spanish influenza that started in 1918, and they didn't finish going around the world to 1920. So just, you know, that was the last time there was a very serious pandemic where it wiped out 50 million people, you know, and that was in 19, you know, 18 through 1920. So just, uh, you know, stay safe out there. Try to, you know, understand what's going on. You know, the news is starting to cover a little more. I've seen mainstream news, but it's still not getting the attention it should. So just be smart. Yeah, I think those are uh, those are wise words. Just be smart as to the best of your abilities. Um, what do you think? Should we jump into this uh, Bcash yeah, developer 100%. tech? Yeah, I mean, this was a. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I should say that. The... Yeah, so, you know, this happened, I guess, over the last week or so. There was a proposal for um, 12.5% of the block reward to be um, essentially given to a developer fund. So those funds could be dispersed for funding of um, Bitcoin Cash development. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that. It's a change in monetary policy. And 
you know, from a technical standpoint, you're like, oh, it's just a fork of Bitcoin. Who gives a shit? And and I do agree. It you know, it's just a shit coin. But the interesting thing to talk about is that it's a change in monetary policy and how easy it is to simply change the monetary policy for some of these shit coins. And you compare that with say. Uh, the monetary policy of gold or the monetary policy of of Bitcoin, it is it is different when you're dealing with the the underlying asset itself. Uh, it would be nearly impossible to um, to change the mon- monetary policy of Bitcoin, and it it is set in stone, and that's something you know. Satoshi took pretty seriously, you know, I I forget what the quote is, but it's pretty much like, you know, once once the code was released and it was set and 21 million was the limit, like uh, that's kind of it. You know, there's no going back. You're going to have to figure it out some other way. And you can see the relation between, you know, our current monetary policy with fiat money and how very easy it is to just change that on a whim. Right. You know, I've been talking about the I, I bet you it's nearly a trillion dollars that's been pumped into the repo markets over the last call it a year or so. It's been less than that. But, you know, I'm rounding up. And no, you know, nobody voted on that. There wasn't unanimous consensus to increase the money supply, to um, extend additional credit to hedge funds that apparently needed it. It just kind of happened. And nobody, the holders of the money didn't get to step in and say, whoa, 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 you, you're going to actually, you're going to make my money worth less if you guys pump another trillion dollars into the economy because things don't seem to be going right. And I think that was the important part to point out about this story. I don't know. What, what do you think about how uh, easy it is for monetary policy to change for other things that are money? I agree with you there. It's, 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 an, it's another example where clearly it's not a decentralized process. You know, a, a select few people can choose what they want to do and now they get a 12.5 tax to fund developers, which is just free money for them to do whatever the fuck they want. Um, if there's any development really going on with Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> right. And as you said, you just put it perfectly in the terms of the repo system with the Fed. No Americans got to vote on this. Well, obviously the Fed's a private institution, but you know most people don't understand that. But long story short, no Americans got to vote on this. We're just gonna they're just printing money now willingly because to support what to support uh, you know equity and bond prices for another I don't know however many months. But right. clearly, it doesn't matter what they do. And we're I I firmly think this is our. Black Swan is this coronavirus. I think it's going to take a few more weeks for maybe this to play out because I think you're going to have to see like real pandemic and just the gears of the global economy start to show down, slow down. And it doesn't matter what the Fed does at that point because if people fucking stop doing shit and people stop shipping everything, you know, people stop traveling, it's going to screw up everything. I mean, think about the tour, tour, tourism industry is going to get wrecked by this if this goes on. Yeah, you you bring up a lot of good points about that, and it's if you assume you know a, a part of an economy shuts down for a week or two, um, just assume all best case scenarios you can you can handle a a black swan event pandemic type issue. Just I think black swan in general is just a good term to talk about here when you're kind of doing thought experiments on this kind of stuff. There's a black swan event happening, and you have two weeks of your economy or a portion of it that kind of shuts down and not much is going on or it gets cut in half or whatever metric you want to talk about. It, it takes a little while for that the impact of that to flow back through the economy and then it kind of ripples out on a global scale, right? Because of, you know, things weren't being made in China and then, you know, they had buyers in Chile or somewhere else and they didn't get their product and so on and so on and so on. Like it really ripples out and it takes a long time to kind of see how this plays out. So even if you assume there's a best case scenario that – Black Swan event happens. It's fixed in two weeks. Um, there's an impact, period. And you know, when you put together these big macro kind of puzzle pieces, it's like you know, this one's pretty good, right? It fits an interesting narrative for uh, Bitcoiners and like, if you're Kyle Bass or a Kyle Bass fan, you know, he's Kyle like Bass he's always dad, ripping. Dude, he's, he's probably he's having his day, dude. He's probably dude, blowing champagne in his fucking office, like, office, dude. I was like, <laughs> he's probably sitting on his porch drinking whiskey, like smoking a cigar. Like I fucking told you guys, this was gonna happen, and he's been like. He's been salivating, waiting for this moment. And like, I hate saying this because it's kind of it's, people are dying. I'm yeah, not no, trying it's to be fucked. fucked up here, but like, you know, and I'm sure Kyle would never do this. It was just like a meme I'm thinking in my.
my head of like, I can imagine him being like, I told, I fucking told you guys so. And this is like, you know, is this a Chernobyl moment where it's like, okay, something really catastrophic, that ideal, that picturesque black swan it. happens. And then it's like, okay. And so that's the thing that, uh, it makes me nervous. It gets, uh, like I'm anticipating that, right? Like I, I really want to know. And then at the same time, I want to see selfishly how Bitcoin responds or or gold responds in, in this kind of environment when like the global macro is just so fragile and things are happening. I want to see how things react in real time to this. And I think that's, uh, that's what makes the whole thing so magical that you can have uh, now something if you wanted to store your value in that's like outside of this system and I think gold's really similar to that and, and other things and that's where the whole thing comes full circle that's super interesting yeah no, I agree with you how you know how assets like Bitcoin gold silver people say safe haven assets or whatever will respond uh, and I guess people probably get angry if I said Bitcoin's a safe haven asset or whatever I'm just putting it under there because that's what you know people kind of the people who you know talk about Bitcoin, that's what they put it under. Um, anyways, getting back to the point here, this um, with Bitcoin and gold rallying on this, you know, it's it's got to be a question of you know, do they continue to rally? And if it, if it really shit, it really hits the fan. Is this is this Bitcoin's white swan? I don't know if that's a correct term, but <laughs> like, is this good? You know, it's so good for a sense. Is this enough to get Bitcoin back to twenty k? Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, I like that you brought that up because on it fits my personal narrative, right? We are four more months, four and a half months before the halving. And if you, you know, you put your stock to flow hat on and you go back and look at all your historical charts, you're thinking to yourself, okay, it's six months before the halving, four months. Uh, we're going to rally into the having, we're going to sell the news and then, you know, it's, it's bull market time and then it's off to the races after that. And then you have throw in this black swan that neither one of us could have predicted four weeks ago happening. And it's like, okay, well, that's an interesting coincidence. Now, what ends up actually happening is, you know, who the fuck knows. But to to think about how monetary policy changes in these kinds of circumstances and, you know, to, to tie it all back in, it will be interesting to see if things do get worse from a black swan event standpoint. What do we see happen with monetary policy, say in China or, or here if, or other economies, if, if, uh, it progresses into something that actually ends up slowing down, uh, the global system, you know, th that's the response, right? You respond with monet, you, you respond, uh, by adjusting the money supply. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find a Shanghai, oh, Shanghai composite. Let's see how wrecked this is. It's, it's getting pretty hurt right now to say the lease is down two and a half, 2.75%. It's probably open. Oh, it's not open right now, but it might be lunch break. But I'm just, it's going to be interesting. I just have no idea how this is going to play out. This could be, you know, this could be our, our due time as a human race to get just slapped in the face. You know, for, <laughs> I mean, think about the last, um, you know, the last real pandemic. There was, they said there was three in the 20th century, and the first one was the, the real one was the um, Spanish flu, but the other ones were like a million dead and like two million dead. And like, I think one was in the fifties and one was in the sixties. Um, and you think about it, like a million dead of people, it probably was, you know, a 2 billion person world, 3 billion, you know, that's still a lot of bodies. You know? Right. That's nothing, as you would say, nothing to sneeze at. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's something to sneeze at. And I think we're, we're in that situation where I, people are really underestimating this and, I think it's going to take a drastic effect on our lives, at least for the next, you know, coming months. It's not going away, as I said. It's not. That's the thing. I, I think a lot of people, just normal fucking normies who aren't paying attention to this, think it's just going to fucking disappear. It's not. It's And that's the worst part. It's not like, so. Right. No, that's a good point. Do you want to um, attack the uh, Bitcoin gold? Like the yeah, yeah, yeah. Attack? This was, um, <laughs> speaking of monetary policy, this was also an interesting one that I that I came across this past week. Uh, Bitcoin gold was 51% attacked to the tune of $70,000 double spend. Looks like it happened. The first one was about 1,900 BTG for around 20 grand, 19 grand, and then there was a second one for over 5,000 BTC, and that was around $50,000 worth of BTC. So I wanted to look up the cost to attack 
for Bitcoin Cash or for Bitcoin Gold and, and other proof of work coins. And it looks like the cost to 51% attack Bitcoin Gold is only like 800 bucks an hour, which is not much. I'm pretty sure Bitcoins was around 650,000 to try to perform a 51% attack, assuming you could actually get all the hash rate to pull it off. Um, it would, I mean, it's significantly more expensive. Like a, a kid in his dorm room can pull off an $800, 51% attack on Bitcoin gold and nobody's going to give a shit. Interestingly, speaking about not giving a shit, nothing happened to the price of Bitcoin gold, which is interesting because no one cares, <laughs> right? Did the, did the price not go down because nobody cares? Did the price not go down because, um, people aren't, up, as upset with what happens if somebody gets 51% attack? Like, if that happens to a coin, is it like, oh, it's like a demerit? It's like not a big deal? Or I'm assuming it's more because nobody gives a shit about Bitcoin gold. But um, I was thinking as these, and you made a good point when, before we started recording, the market cap of some of these coins that are very trivial to 51% attack is is high. Some of these were in the billions, right? Yeah, no, it's I have it pulled up over here. It is ridiculous. Like you go down here, um, perfect example, Zcash, four hundred and eighty two million, twelve thousand dollars attack. That's not as bad though. You go to Dash and I assume Dash is what proof of stake now? No, they're still proof of work. Proof of work. So for three thousand six hundred and six dollars you can attack a one billion dollar market cap. Zeke or um and then Bitcoin Gold's terrible, seven hundred ninety-eight dollars. It's like, jeez, you go down to a fifty-one million dollar market cap. A uh, Eternity, six hundred sixty-nine dollars. Uh, ETP, which is Metaverse, it's a twenty-six million dollar market cap, two hundred twenty-nine dollars. I mean, it's it's absolutely mind-boggling. Um, right. It it's just so easy to fifty-one percent attack these shit coins. And I guess I I was going, I was thinking about this. I wanted to get your take on it. Your shit isn't safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a really good point. Your your shit definitely isn't safe. Um, but do you think that the you know more coins will get fifty one percent attacked, and that will cause them to die, or as they're dying, they get fifty one percent attacked? Or do you think in this case, this fifty one percent attack was really somebody just testing it out, seeing if they could actually do it for maybe research purposes or or something else? They're going to write up a medium article. Who the hell knows? Um, and that people really just don't care that much about these shit coins to to bother 51% attacking them. It's not it's not worth it in the end at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean you mentioned earlier that it's a, still a lot of work just for 51% attacking and moving the coins around. You still got to go sell them at exchanges there's, and there's the risk involved. So it's there's a lot involved but like literally going up the list basically up to even Ethereum. Ethereum costs 91,583 but Bitcoin Cash ABC I forgot Bitcoin Cash ABC is twenty seven thousand dollars. It's a six point seven billion Bitcoin SV at five point four seven billion, twenty four thousand dollars. Even Litecoin, which is three point eight eight billion, is seventeen thousand dollars and sixty six hundred fifty eight attacks. So, I mean, that's insane. And I'm surprised we haven't just seen even major chains higher up like Litecoin just get attacked. I mean, there's got to be some, you know crazy man out there crazy collective group is like fuck it let's just screw every altcoin i mean yeah, you know it's it, yeah it, you think it would be profitable if you had a team doing it i was thinking i wonder if the reason that most people don't want to do it because there is that um there there is a risk to doing it right you actually have to pull it off you need the sunk cost of using up all the energy to 51% attack to rewrite the chain sent now. And I think this is where people get hung up. You do need to send the coins to an exchange, sell them and then do the attack. You know, you have to go through that process where you're, where you're making the profit and you're taking that profit in another coin or say tether or Bitcoin or something like that. There's also the risk of you're sending that to an exchange that probably has KYC. So then what do you do? Um, so there's that inherent risk of you could get caught, right? We are talking about, um, doing these on a blockchain. Like there is a, a way to do analysis to try to work backwards and figure out who pulled it off. And 
what exchange do you send it to without KYC to try to get this done? Um, and we have heard about coins being frozen that were stolen from certain things and being held on the exchange. You know, it can happen. Um, there isn't that infrastructure, a lot of it, where you can kind of get this done on a KYC free basis. So I, I, that, that thought did cross my mind as to why we don't see it more often. Yeah, I, it, it surprised me. That's as you were saying, the KYC part. I, just, I mean, if you think about every exchange basically requires KYC now pretty much. Maybe, maybe except for BitMEX. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I'm sure there's BitMEX, and uh, some people have legacy like Bitfinex accounts that aren't yeah. heavily KYC. And if you were only sending Bitcoin back and forth, you never really needed the KYC. And you know, some people got lucky and they have KYC, no KYC on the exchange that they use. I mean, you know, more power to them. Yeah, no, it's. I'm just surprised after looking at these numbers because we've done at least one podcast before we've touched on this, but I think there's been a few. Uh, where we've touched on this, and I'm surprised we haven't seen more attacks. Um, but I'm sure as time goes on, inevitably, inevitably there will be more attacks at this point. Uh, do you want to talk about the last of Square Crypto is creating a Lightning Development Kit for Bitcoin wallets? Yeah, definitely. This was uh... a <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, this just wanted to that. You go ahead. This was this was a. Uh... This is good news. This was probably the best piece of news that I've seen in January, actually. January has been a pretty shitty month to the start of 2020. And I thought this was <laughs> relatively good news in comparison. Um, and from a high level, so let me, let me go into this for a bit. So Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter Square, decides we're going to fund open source development for cryptocurrency related stuff. And the people that he hired were excellent developers. One is um, he's ex-Google, loves Bitcoin, d does a lot of uh, work with uh, core development. Uh, another one who worked at Blockstream, fantastic developer. He's uh, rewriting the mining protocol, stuff like that. I mean, really competent developers are, are working at Square Crypto. And they finally came out and said, okay, this is our big project that we're working on, and they're going to make a lightning development kit. And I was just listening to Marty Bent's podcast, and he, he had this whole team on, so definitely go check that episode out, um, where they're basically creating a way um, by building a new Lightning implementation that existing wallets that exist today, like Samurai, Dropit, or whatever else you might use, can easily just go ahead and plug and play and create um, a way to use Lightning inside of their wallet. And some wallets are only on-chain layer one wallets, and then you need to go do a whole separate process to have your Lightning wallet. And that's, for the enthusiast, they don't care what's the difference. But for the everyday person who keeps their shit on Coinbase, like they don't know the difference between layer one, layer two, what's Lightning, all this other stuff. So it, the tools are just being built so that other wallets that are already being used can start to integrate that. And... You know, if I'm and this is this is where I kind of wanted to get your take on it. You know, we heard about Jack deciding that he's going to go to Africa for six months this year and live. And he might be looking at himself and say, OK, well, I'm the CEO of Square, the fastest growing financial company on the planet. If, if you really want to talk about it that way, there's seven billion people that are unbanked and he's already been working with the unbanked in the United States because some people don't have a bank account, they literally only use Cash App as their bank account. Um, and, and he looks at there's 7 billion people who don't have access to the financial rails that you and I do, that we take for granted for every single day, probably. Uh, and you think, okay, you know, for a couple million bucks over the next few years, I can fund development on what I'm thinking might be the future of financial rails. And I already have a very large and growing financial services company that I could very quickly with, you know, the snap of a finger start to integrate on a global scale. So you have, um, you know, people who are living in countries with hyperinflation, you can get some square readers in there and boom, you're, you're trying to get them onto, you know, the financial system, but you're using Bitcoin this time. So I, my question was, do you think that more, more companies that are thinking longer term about this and might be bullish on Bitcoin would would say to themselves, I'm gonna I'm gonna fund open source development that I can then build on 
in the future that not, I don't need it today, but I'm going to need it five years from now, maybe 10 years from now. That's going to unlock so much more value, say, for stockholders or profitability or whatever. What do you think? Um, yeah, it's, it's you know, Square's definitely taken a, I think, like, you, like I even opened up the Square app recently today in terms of the intuitiveness. It's a lot better. And obviously it's getting, I think it's gained a shit ton more traction than, um, Venmo has Venmo seems to be only younger people, you know what I mean? Like kids my age and younger. Uh, and Square has seemed to take in the lead. Now it seems like even more people I know my age and older are using Square. And the fact that you can buy Bitcoin off it uh, is just taking them to a whole nother, you know, level on top of, you know, the ability to send cash around. Um, and then the, the, the intuitiveness, buying Bitcoin's easy on it. It's not like, you know, putting money onto, a, you know, like actually going to use not I wouldn't say Coinbase, but using something like Kraken, Bitstamp, Bitrex, you name it, Polynex, you can go on forever. Um, it's definitely a much more user friendly experience that we don't see that much with Bitcoin. And from right. here forward, it's gonna, it's I mean, it's obvious as you said, it's the it's the fastest growing uh, payment company. Is that correct? What you said or Financials. Yeah, yeah, Cash, yeah, Cash App. I mean, and Square. You know, they're one of the fastest growing financial services company, and Cash App's like the number one finance app in the App Store. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have rappers singing about it. You have all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you're, you're cash right. Tags. Cash, I mean, app, cash tags. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I mean, it's if you don't if you don't personally use it with anybody else, you think you're like, oh, you know, what's Cash App? But there's a whole there's millions of people using it that you don't realize are are using it, and um you know, how it's replacing a bank account for a lot of these people. And I think that's what is left out. And if you're Jack and you're sitting yourself and you're looking at this like, hmm, all these people that are unbanked already already have the a pretty decent user experience all figured out. And if you've ever like purchased something at a uh, a small business or any business that uses like a square terminal, it's the best like payment experience for the for the customer ever. It's super fast. It's so much easier than the other chip readers. You stick the card in, take it out. It's like a few seconds max. You sign on the screen on the iPad. You They flip the iPad back around. I mean, it's a really slick um, way to check out. And, you know, I can just see like Bitcoin would be pretty sweet on there. You know, say you're a, you're a merchant and you want 2% of every sale that you make automatically converted into Bitcoin. And you could just do that right at the per time of purchase or sale. Like that could happen. Or if you want to, you know, fund a micro economy in Ghana, like you can do that too. And you already have that beautiful UX built, and and now you're you're paying people to develop the Bitcoin part of it. That other, the other side of the financial system that you think might become a thing in the decades to come. You start funding that shit now. And I think Jack is seeing that and is he's, starting to, you know, he's, in 10 years he's going to make a lot of fucking money doing it. It's not like he's doing it for, you know, he's a nice guy and everything. He loves Bitcoin. I'm very thankful to have him in the space. But in reality, Square is going to just dominate if if he's betting correctly yeah. and he's funding this infrastructure, he's going to destroy everybody and, and make billions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, assuming the coronavirus doesn't completely screw our society, Jack is going <laughs> to... He's already the, he's a CEO of two large publicly traded companies, Twitter and, C and Square. I mean, he's gonna by the, by twenty thirty, it's gonna be insane to see where he's at. If you know, assuming everything goes well, um, you know, especially as we mentioned, I think and I think Square's worth more than Twitter now. I'm pretty sure. Square, yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you're right about that actually. And Twitter's been around a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting, and it's it's cool to see Jack kind of get back to his open source roots and start to think about you know what does a public open source social media client look like and maybe twitter can just be like a client on top of that and that people choose to use and people can use other things it is it is fascinating to see how um how he's responding like as he matures as an entrepreneur and how you know he's one of the very few that is thinking this way and it's mm -hmm. It's honestly pretty fucking refreshing, considering we keep getting the digital panopticon like stomped on our faces every day, and facial recognition and all kinds of other so, bullshit. So hear me out. It's on like kind of nice, yeah. I think they got this fucked up. They said for Twitter, they say CEO Jack Dorsey September thirtieth, twenty fifteen, but for Square, they say Jack Dorsey CEO two thousand nine. 
Am I wrong here? Is didn't you know, I'm I'm really not 100% sure. Jack was also CEO of Twitter and then not CEO of Twitter and then came back, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So it could be – that could have something to do with it. But I want to say – well, actually, no. Square might be 2009 because Twitter's prior to 2009. I don't I didn't need that, but still. Yeah, and Square might be a fucking Releasing, older than you think. It really is. You know, May 2020. Yeah, you're right. It is that much old. I didn't realize there was that. I mean, I I remember the the first ones where you you put the square reader inside the aux the, the aux jack, yeah. and it was oh, the no. whole thing was you'd get it for free, and then you yeah. it was pretty cool at the time. No. I mean, it's still pretty fucking sweet. Every every time I go to the no, farmers I, market, every the person that, has a square uh, reader. I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's it's cool to see a jack kind of jump in and. Not give back, but he is kind of giving back to Bitcoin and funding all this shit. And it, it's sweet that he's uh, that he's doing it. I give the guy a lot of fucking credit, and especially if he goes to Africa for six months and whatever he's going to do over there. How, how I mean, much Bitcoin does he have? <laughs> he's got, dude. There's been there's been tweets of his where he like he maxes out like his ten thousand dollar limit on Cash App. Like multiple times where he's just like click, buying click, and click, click, click. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I think he posted one time about one like billion. he's like, he's like, oh, I like hit the limit on Cash App. And it's like, you know, he's, uh, yeah, right. He's Soft worth flex. how much money. And, but, you know, for the, for the Bitcoin plebs, we're like, holy shit, Jack maxed out his fucking buy limit on his weekly buy limit. Like, how, what a baller, you know? Uh, that's, that's cool for the average, for the average person to see the average, mm-hmm. you know, bitcoin enthusiast to see jack you know pump his own bags it's sick yeah uh it'll be i'm i'm curious to see you know you know what happens with that i think squares i mean twitter's obviously still big but i think squares gonna be so much bigger as you know i agree with you but then again how is everything gonna be repriced what's the definition of bigger (laughs) that's always what i come back to yeah yeah if you think about like a big deflationary kind of thing what does relative value even look yeah, like man, anymore. I, no, I, 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 don't I don't know. Yeah, like what what is going to be relative? Like these trillion dollar companies aren't going to be a thing in like are they going to be a thing in 10 years? I don't think so. Right. Like really No, no. no. Like that's a good point. It's like It's like that's gone so vertical. And like it could go higher, but I just don't see it. You know? Yeah, no. A lot of stuff seems very what, interesting. What does it get repriced into? What what's going to be worth a lot? And that's the thing that confuses me. It's like we don't know what our dollar is worth. And I know we always talk about this, but it's like, how is everything going to be repriced? What if Square is a big company in 10 years and it's the same price? Does that, I mean, you know. No, what? yeah. You, and, and this is where, you know, the, the Bitcoiner in me turns around and says, well, some people say, you know, Bitcoin's like, Bitcoin is a stable coin. Just at least because you know what the supply is. So I know every, you know, hundred bucks worth of Bitcoin I buy or whatever. I'm like, all right, I took those sats off the market. They're mine. I, I know that at least that much BTC will be worth at least that much BTC. Maybe not priced in US dollars, gold, land, or diamonds or something else, but it it's still that that much. But when you look about when you look at these other companies, you're right. You know, maybe in ten years, Apple's still around. It it it, it made it through. Square is absolutely crushing it. It destroys American Express because it rebuilt all new payments technologies. It doesn't need you know visas done. All this other shit's done. Um, big box retailers are integrated. What but what is it worth compared to today and today's money? It's like it's impossible to say because you're right. You don't know the the dollar's been. At, um, become so worthless over the past hundred years. It's like, well, what is it going to be worth in another ten years, right? Yeah, I have, I have no clue. That's what worries me the most. Is like, you know, even a, you know, what, what's going to be expensive? Is a car worth ten thousand dollars? And you know, will things be priced in dollars? And well, I, I assume in ten years they'd still be priced in dollars. Yeah, right. Um, that'd be a drastic change if it wasn't. Uh, right. You know, if you assume now, like in today's money, ten thousand dollars of today's purchasing power, yeah, does that it, what does that it, still it, get? Are you? we right. are we going back to gold back currencies? Uh, you know, who knows? Are we jumping to central bank digital shit coins? I hope not. I don't think we will. I think people hopefully are smart enough. But. Yeah, I think that also that gives them the benefit of the doubt of like you still need to pull that off right if you're going to do a bait and switch and move to a central bank digital currency by all means go for it but it's still it's not like you flip the switch and that happens it still takes um 
engineering efforts. It still takes um, resources, just, you know, they're scarce resources in an economy and they can only do so much at one time. So how much can possibly get done? You know, I don't, I don't know. Historically, most of their programs and ideas haven't worked out all that well. So it, it's a bit of a long shot. Yeah. Um, you want to wrap this guy up here? No, yeah, I think that was a good way to wrap it up. Uh, this is episode 69 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Spotify. Shoot us a DM. Uh, let us know what you want us to talk about. It really helps us set up the uh, episodes for the future. Um, big month. January is coming to a close. 2020 starting. Four and a half months to the having. I mean, shit is hitting the fan. Buckle up, right? Yeah, yeah shit's hitting the fan. <laughs> shit's shit's hitting buckle the fan. The fuck up. It's a whole new decade. <laughs> Fucking buckle up. Good luck and stay safe out there, everyone. <laughs> yep. Peace. <laughs>